So I would like to thank you again for being here. I would like to say that uh, we are open to all Greeks. We want to give you all uh, in a simple way, you know, some uh, ideas. And I would like to invite Mr. Christophoros Pisaridis, who is um, He inspired me when I was younger. He inspired me to work for the World Bank. And he is a person who has inspired leaders, has inspired countries, and he has managed to do a lot many, ti many times in the forefront or perhaps behind the scenes as a good academic. So we have him with us. As Unfortunately, not with us here, but, you know, virtually at least. And I would like to ask you, regarding this crisis we're facing here in Greece, and we're not entirely sure why it is, why it happened. Was it because uh, it's an accounting problem? There was an accounting mistake in the numbers? Or is it a structural crisis? What is the nature of this crisis? We're ready to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to um, apologize for not being able to be with you today. And I couldn't um, come to Athens, despite the fact that I'm in Nicosia now, which is quite near. I would like to congratulate Elena for her initiative. We have so many examples from other countries and so many lessons to learn on growth, on reforms, on restructuring, and not only from countries of Western Europe, shall we say, but from um, the history of communism, the, the relationship between the public and private sector. And unfortunately, sometimes these lessons are not um, taught as well as they should. We don't feel that they're as relevant to us there are international institutions, especially the OECD and the IMF, which stress, however, uh, continually stress the need for analysis and they analyze uh, the policies followed by different countries on reforms. But still, they're not read as much as they should be, I think. And I hope that uh, the meeting today and uh, the work of Thought for Action will bear a result, will make Greeks think in general more comprehensively about what is happening in, in the country. What I would like to say in reply, in response to your question, is that I believe that the crisis in Greece is structural. And what has made it appear so bad today and made us think that the banks are to blame or the Americans are to blame or the loaning, the debt crisis in the States um, is to blame, that's um, the occasion of the crisis, not the cause. Before going into that, I would like to go a little bit further back because I believe that in Greece, we have some institutions uh, perhaps more established than they should, such as legislation, and at a time where the global reality is very different. So we should go back to the 50s or 60s when things were very different and um, things were very different on a global basis then. So through the changes we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years, we had to have a kind of smooth updating of the economy, which did not happen in Greece. And I believe that that's where the problem lies. That's what we should build on to change the country. The global economy has changed in a way that uh, was unimaginable perhaps 30 years ago. 
It has become more open. It has become more globalized. Globalization is true. It has changed the way in which um, we should think about economy. Technology has changed things a lot. Um, it has become more impersonal and it can be copied more easily. Today, all countries in the world use Microsoft's and Apple's products. 40 years ago, there was no technology that could be used on such a global basis. International trade has uh, grown much, much faster than global production. And all these developments have ne necessitated for the success of our current economy, have necessitated competitiveness. If we are not competitive, then um, as an economy, we will fail. When I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum two weeks ago, we they went participants went there to discuss different issues, but Essentially, competitiveness as a word kept cropping up. That's what I kept listening to. Greece failed in this. Not only now, but even before the crisis. Greece was never a highly competitive economy. It was an economy, it was protected, it was in a protectionist regime, and that's why we didn't see this these issues of competitiveness but we were heading for a crisis sooner or later when I joined the EU and opened its economy to the other countries and the other countries and the EU opened its economy on a global basis. Then if we have a country that is not competitive, it's going to suffer a crisis. Definitely. What we should examine now is what caused this um, limited competitiveness. And the answer can only be the distortions of our economy. The limitations in free trade in professions, our extensive red tape, our great delays and corruption, of course. That is where we see the uh, lack of rigidity of our economy because an economy today has to be flexible in all levels and in all markets, in the products market and in the services market and the labor market. Entrepreneurs need incentives to be competitive on a global scale. I think you talked about the lack of incentives in Greece to for increasing our productivity. Entrepreneurs need help from the state through proper infrastructure and fast responses. In Greece, we are lacking in this section. We could also say that um, our high debt is a result of these distortions of our economy, not the cause of what we are seeing now, but more a result due to the lack of flexibility and um, uh, this has changed the role of the public sector from a facilitator of, produc of production to a sector that guarantees the absorption of production through the absorption of labor with high wages and leading to high debt. This is this is so. This is actually a result what we're seeing today. It's a result of this protectionist uh, regime that we had up until recently. To break this vicious cycle of low competitiveness, high taxation, and bloated public public sector, we need structural reforms and this is not easy to achieve I could talk about uh, where I think the difficulties in reform lie and uh, say a few things about my experience with other countries should I continue on this or should this be more interactive with questions if you don't mind, you can continue for a bit and we'll have three, four questions from the panel that will help in the interaction. Okay, sorry, I, 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 I can't see you, so it's a little bit confusing. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm going to beam myself up to Nicosia. So, why are reforms so difficult? 
First of all, because there are um, many people who oppose this. There, they, there needs to be political will and decisiveness to apply these reforms, and I will talk about this in later on. Uh, but I think that um, essentially these reforms will cost votes in England, for example. The problems, uh, the distortions of the British economy had first appeared in uh, 1976 under a under, uh, left Labour government. They called the IMF and um, it had uh, provided many recommendations about uh, restructuring, restructuring, but the government tried it to avoid this, much like the government is doing today in Greece, uh, you know, but we're not going to talk about that now. The labor unions then went on huge strikes opposing the reforms, and uh, we see this in Greece now. And what was the result? It was that the Callaghan government then did not manage to pass any reforms, lost the elections of 1979, and Thatcher came to power. And when she saw the situation there, she started reforms without coordination, without asking for any opinion. So she kind of said that, I am I will do it. Nobody else managed it. So um, the situation there was dire, but she... And it meant that for 18 years, Britain had a right-wing government. And when uh, the Labour came back to power with Tony Blair, we couldn't really describe him as an old-school Labour politician, but a, a social democrat, perhaps, who supported a free market. And this is... Since then, we see in Britain a free market. I think that the reforms that he brought, um, and with Blair and uh, Gordon Brown, this has increased the, his competitiveness. We see the same with Schroeder in Germany. Germany in 2002 was uh, described as the sick man of Europe. And Schroeder, despite being a social democrat, and it was more difficult to oppose the labor unions, he managed to say that if we don't change our economy, if we don't make the labor market more flexible, if we don't change the limitations that we have in the product market, in um, opening times of stores, Germany's competitiveness is going to start lagging and we will not be able to continue exporting our products. And this is what Germany relies on. So this convinced the various stakeholders and the reforms were brought in between 2003 and 2005. And um, what we see today is that, of course, they need time to be implemented and to bear results. In England and Britain, they needed four to five years, perhaps more, because um, some of them um, took place much later. In Germany, they needed three to four years to bear results. But after these difficult periods, we see that these countries, Britain and Germany, are the most competitive countries in Europe. So let's compare them to Italy. Italy has not applied any reforms up until uh, Monti's uh, government. Uh, and I mean, Monti has tried, but he's only had two or three years, and he needs at least four. I believe that competitiveness, Italy's competitiveness will increase, but that depends on the next elections. The same happens in Spain. Spain had started lagging. I mean, its um, unemployment rate is perhaps higher than even than Greece's, but there too we have had reforms. The great difficulty is that um, the unions have not um, are not applying these reforms as much as they should, but they have been passed in, but we haven't seen any results yet. The only results we've seen is that the Troika, or at least the EU, uh, kind of 
see Spain in a much friendlier way now, Spain and its banking system, than they do Greece, for example, because they believe that Spain has proceeded more to reforms and these will bear results over time. And we have seen um, quite a few reforms in Greece, but we haven't seen the results yet. What we need is patience. So what can we do now? in this uh, period of change where so when we do have changes but before they bear results i believe that the troika in greece at least has made the mistake of um not paying as much attention as it should to development and investment programs a government that faces many expenses and wants to curb these the, the, the most uh, the easier thing to 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 cut down is investment they just postpone that they say oh we can only do that in the future it's much easier to do this than to cut down on salaries and the public sector or social benefits and this is what happened in Greece this is what's happening in Cyprus now but this is not good for unemployment and as far as I know, although we haven't really signed anything here in Cyprus, the IMF at least has asked from the government not to not to um, stop any investment and infrastructure projects because after a study by the IMF's economists, uh, especially Mr. Plashar, who is its chief economist. So these have shown that um, development and infrastructure projects are the most important measure we can take against unemployment. And essentially, it's um, the largest problem in Europe is that of unemployment. So that's what I want to say. But before I finish, I want to talk briefly about the main points that I believe we need to focus on to modernize uh, an economy, I'll, I mean, I've kind of um, mentioned these, but I'll talk about them very briefly. Four things. First, production needs to be in the hands of the private sector. If there are branches, industries that uh, are considered highly sensitive, okay, they can remain in the public sector, but their management, their administration should follow a private sector model. We need to avoid too many um, employment contracts um, or we see this quite a lot in Greece. Only such a system can ensure the competitiveness that we need in an economy. The second point I want to stress is that the state apart from its political power in the economic sector should only should only um work in unemployment and protecting the lower economic strata so the third thing is that employers are flexible in selecting um their um their working hours and who they will employ under the the based on the principles of international conventions and the fourth thing is that salaries and overtime and such should be determined by collective agreements after public consultation salaries must reflect the the, the productivity of the company and the, of the employees and not the political power of the company. Monopolies need to be abolished, both from the side of the unions and from the side of employers. This is what I wanted to say. I hope that it will help. And I'm here for any questions. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to have a look at the moderation at the moderator. We'll uh, proceed to the questions by the panel. For two questions. Yes. Uh, I want to pass on a couple of questions that we have uh, over the internet. Would the panelists like to comment anything about anything? Any questions? Yes, Christophorus. Good morning. I am Panayotis Karkatsoulis. 
uh, sorry, I'm uh, trying to look at you as if you're uh, looking at me, but... Uh, so as I heard uh, what you were saying, I remembered something. Um, two or three years ago, Luca Cazzelli, who is with us here today, was uh, organized an event to talk about the budget, uh, new ways of drafting, of preparing the budget um, beyond the conventional ways that we know. So we were brainstorming and uh, we had to find a way. We reached a point where we wanted to see how we could link the money, the funds in the budget to certain result. But we had to find how the formula to do this. We, I mean, we have, you know, we were a bit confused because we said that, all right, we need to fix some problems with the state to be able to do this. So after we discussed this in depth, at some point, um, uh, Mrs. Catelli came up to me and and uh, Mr. Arsenis, Marcus Arsenis, came to me, and he asked me something that I will never forget. He said, OK, that's how things are. I agree. We need to have these changes. And because Christophoros Pisaridis was again talking about changes as regards organization, the function of the state, shall we talk, say, bureaucracy, I believe that what uh, that what Arseni said was uh, critical. He said, who is driving this? Who is pushing us to do this? And I said, um, I didn't know what to say. I, it was, it was self-obvious to me that these changes had to be made. I, I mean, what does it mean who's pushing for, for, for these changes? But the question is, at this juncture, can someone tell me who is pushing for this packet of reforms. So I, I actually have three sub-questions. Is it the Troika? It's clear uh, from uh, what um, was insinuated. It's kind of like, no, definitely not. It's not. It's pressing for results. It's not saying how you're going to go from A to B. So when we don't have the results, then the answer by our creditors is always the same. Well, find a different way to, to get results. You could do it through reforms, but if we, you can't do it from reforms, do it in another way. Two, is it Greek parties pressing for these reforms? Absolutely not. On the contrary, and this is something that I would like to discuss with Elena Panaritis, because uh, she said that we do things kind of randomly. I think that they're not random, that there is a, a logic behind this madness. Although it appears that it's unstructured, there is sense. And the third sub-question sub is, is it the private sector pushing us? Because I don't think it is either. I can't see it in the sense that, OK, they're talking about it, but it's very different. Talking is very different from organizing something. And personally, apart from all this general stuff they talk about, you know, free trade and all that and blah, 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 that's it. That's what they say. All right, we need to be more relaxed. And, you know, what's that? All this is just wishful thinking, and time passes. There's been like, we've had the crisis for two years at least. We've spent so many resources. We see some kind of half-formed uh, proposals, but I person personally do not see an agenda that has been proposed, you know, and a commitment on this agenda that it is being pushed into action. And I miss this from all stakeholders. So. My actual question, and sorry about uh, taking so much time, is who are with us for these reforms? Yes, that's a very good question because um, you're kind of um, linking uh, politics with economics, uh, so political economy, which is uh, essentially what uh, we should we, we focus on at our universities 
today. Um, to reply, based on what we know thus far, Let's see the, 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 the three sub-questions. Is the Troika pressing? Um, the Troika, yes, is pressing for results. Troika is essentially a creditor who wants to secure, to ensure that given that there is no guarantee, or we can't tell, there's no collateral, okay, we're not going to pledge Greece, you know, if we don't uh, use, you know, it doesn't work that way because it's um, we're talking about international organizations here that provide lending. So the Troika wants to see results in our economy because it wants to ensure that the economy, by through taxation or whatever, will be able to pay these, uh, these l loans. Yes, the Troika wants results, does not interested in the, the methods, but the experts who work in these organizations think in this way. This is how they've been trained in uh, the universities, Anglo-Saxon universities, based on the f principles of free market. This is what they all believe. And especially um, they've been influenced um, mainly by Friedman and the Chicago School. And they believe that the best way to for a country to achieve results, the, resu the results they want to see, is these reforms, flexible economy, shrinking of the state, low taxation, especially for companies. They believe this. Either we like it or not. We might not believe it, but this is what they believe. So if we, they say that if we see a country heading on a course towards these reforms, then we feel more convinced that in a few years, um, perhaps to 20 to 30 in 10, 20 years, the country will have achieved these results that we want to see and we will get our money back. That's, that, that, that's how they think that the Troika, if we tell the Troika, you know, um, we should, you shouldn't be interested in these results because we will be able to pay the debt in 20 years because we will discover petrol and this, we guarantee that. I think that they would accept it in principle and um, especially here in Cyprus and the run up to the elections. This is what one of the candidates says. He argues that we should um, end the MOU and give them bonds for our natural gas. But I think that it, it would be a great mistake because they would still accept this. But uh, essentially what the Troika believes is that they want to, to see um, they, 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 their belief is based on their, their training system and they believe that after the reforms, the country will probably achieve the requested results. Now, regarding the Greek parties, I agree with you. The Greek parties do not want the reforms. Uh, I think the same can be said for Cyprus because they are managed by, you know, there are conflicting interests and it's the political um, it's the political parties that have brought this uh, problem to the economy and administration and of course public employees in uh, Cyprus and in Greece are uh, have a preferential treatment which they will lose through these reforms and of course they oppose them and we have seen that all parties that have pressed for reforms have lost the next elections. Only in China this is not true, and they don't have a democracy there. So, and I go to China quite often, and I was talking about uh, a member of the party there, and we'd, um, you know, we were on good terms, so I was quite open with him. I said, how do you handle the problem of um, the lack of democracy? You don't have an open uh, consultation. Um, he said, politics are very different, 
difficult for the common man to understand. Look at how much we have achieved without democracy. This is how they think. Schroeder has lost the elections. Thatcher would have lost the elections if, um, but for the war in Argentina. And the Falklands um, are the Maldives, as the Argentinians call them, because unfortunately, the best way for a politician to win elections is to declare a war and win it. Anyway, what uh, Greece needs is what we were discussing a few days ago with uh, Mrs. Diamandopoulou in Cyprus. And she said that um, who were the great politicians in Greece who brought in, passed in uh, great reforms? Venizelos Trikoupis, you know. If we look at what happened to them with the then, with the then existing parties, how did they treat them? Not very well. And that's how things should be. We need to have a new, great, decisive reformer who will say that I'm going to do it and it, I don't care if it's going to cost me the elections because, you know, he might lose the elections, but 10 years later, he will have at least a statue raised in his honor. The third thing, the private sector. I believe that the private sector do does want these reforms especially the educated members of the private sector. And the, the private sector in Greece is educated in general. The public sector workers don't want it because they know they will lose a lot of their privileges. And unavoidably, you know, we all think about ourselves first. But the majority of... Um, the public, shall we say, if we had a referendum without um, any other issues, if we had a referendum, shall we say, an experiment, and we called just economists to explain the results of each reform and have a referendum on this. It might sound naive, but I think that if we just presented the results, we would get a vote for the reforms. If we took away all the other um, factors, in the past I had talked with politicians in Cyprus and when I talked about what um, changes we needed in the public sector, I remember someone had said, this cannot happen. It's very difficult because the politician who will do this will lose Nicosia because Nicosia is essentially the headquarters of the public sector. They might win some villages, but if you don't win Nicosia, you're going to lose. So that's, that's what's happening. We have some people who will lose their preferential treatment, but and they shouldn't have them anyway, though. We have inequalities that need to be corrected. That's all. Okay. Um, so let's uh, proceed to just three comments without questions. Is, uh, if Mr. Pisari, this is right, if we had a strong demand for reforms by the private sector, these would have proceeded. But uh, the problem is in Greece is that not even the, the, the private sector wants them, or, or primarily the private sector does not want them. Yes, I agree. So let's move further down. Mrs. Mrs. Richardson. Όλοι. Είναι Apple, Samsung ή έχετε Blackberry. Apple. Ωραία, οπότε. Εγώ κρατώ ένα Blackberry. Το Blackberry χρησιμοποιεί μια πλατφόρμα η οποία έχει γεράσει. Αν δεν αλλάξει θα πεθάνει. Ζούμε σε ένα κόσμο ραγδαίων α, μεταρρυ... καινοτομιών. 
και αν οι χώρε. και οι εταιρείε δεν το κατανοούν αυτό, οι οικονομίε του θα πεθάνουν. Η Ελλάδα βρίσκεται τώρα, χρησιμοποιεί τώρα μια γερασμένη πλατφόρμα, ετοιμόρροπη, ως μια μικρή χώρα, ε, όπου έχουν γίνει ραγδαίες αλλαγές υπό την πίεση αυτών των αλλαγών. Ξέρω ότι μπορείτε να καινοτομήσετε. Μπορείτε να κάνετε Πολύ ριζικές αλλαγές, μεταρρυθμίσεις για να επιτύχετε την καινοτομία και την ανταγωνιστικότητα. Και ενώ η Ελλάδα έχει αυτή τη συζήτηση με την Τρόικα, με το δημόσιο τομέα και με τον ιδιωτικό τομέα, άλλες χώρες έχουν εστιάσει στην καινοτομία. Έτσι λοιπόν, έρχομαι στην Ελλάδα ένα πολύ αισιόδοξο μήνυμα το οποίο είναι αγκαλιάστε αυτές τις επίφοβες καινοτομίε. ακούστε τις φωνές κυρίως της νεολαίας, της νέας γενιάς αγκαλιάστε τις ριζικές μεταρρυθμίσεις που θα δουλέψουν και εν, και Καταφέρετε να έχετε ένα μέλλον όπου οι Έλληνες θα αισθάνονται ότι μπορεί να είναι μια ισχυρά ανταγωνιστική οικονομία στην Νότια Ευρώπη. Αλλά αυτό απαιτεί ένα νέο είδος πολιτικής και ένα πολύ καινούριο είδος ε, ε, στρατηγικής. Και όσον και με κάθε σεβασμό δεν θα το βρείτε αυτό κοιτάζοντας προς τους ευρωπαϊκούς οργανισμούς αλλά θα πρέπει να κοιτάξετε στις χώρες που έχουν προετοιμαστεί να καινοτομήσουν πολύ, σε πολύ ριζικό επίπεδο. Λοιπόν, itself. I would like to uh, jump on that bandwagon and say that if you want to reform your public sector and make it a better facilitator of private sector competitiveness, which was his second theme, you need to introduce as many devices as you can come up with to enhance competitive pressures on agencies in the public sector. Okay, and when I give my little presentation, I will identify, I will, you know, highlight various devices you can use for accomplishing that. It's not undoable, it's perfectly feasible, but you need to, you know, pick devices that will work in your context, etc. Enough said. Um, I would like to say something that uh, might sound slightly conflicting, but it isn't really. In my experience, which uh, some of it has been gained through Gary and uh, another part through Ruth, all governments that have uh, applied uh, structural trade changes have not lost election. No leader of state who has understood the pain of citizens and facilitated their lives has not in exchange has not uh, received uh, the election again so the entire latin america in the 90s for example was uh, administered uh, shall we say by experts uh, reformers politicians whatever after the first five years when they had their elections they were all re-elected to the point 
when that uh, when we had the second uh, term, depending on five years or four years, depending on the system, they try to change the constitution because the citizens wanted to, to vote for them again, but the the constitution would not allow it because, you know, they're very kind of um, um, in line with the U.S. constitution, which says that a president cannot be elected for more than two terms. But um, referendums showed that the citizens wanted the same leaders. So I, um, I believe that this is um, perhaps there's a, a huge problem with this link of the private and the public sector. There are people who want this confused system. They, we want, there are some who want to blame the Americans or the Russians. But if we have a proper leader who will understand the citizens and be able to pass these reforms, I believe that uh, we won't be in a hurry to, to take them down. So that's what I want to say. Yes, uh, th the thing is, we need to find someone who will have the will and the strength to have the... I mean, I remember Thatcher had said when she she was oosted from her party, she had given a fantastic uh, press conference and she was asked, you know, how do you feel now? I believe that I should go and open a store selling spines because they're all spineless now. When I le left the World Bank, that's what I said about my boss. That's all I want to say. Okay. Um, is there perhaps can we have a couple of questions from you? I have some uh, questions uh, over the internet, uh, but uh, I believe that there are two key points based on what uh, Mrs. Pissari they said. First is that uh, the Greek crisis is not a fiscal crisis, is essentially the fiscal problems of Greece are a result of the loss of competitiveness of the Greek economy that pre-existed and uh, kind of worked uh, to heading towards a crisis and thus the problem is not so much fiscal measures necessary or otherwise but the necessary reforms for Greek econ the Greek economy to regain its competitiveness and the second question as Mrs. Karkatudi said is that where do we get the pressure the power to promote these reforms so um, how are we going to achieve the social acceptance of the changes? Uh, so I have a couple of interesting questions from the internet, over the internet. The first is, um, the austerity measures applied in conjunction with defective uh, fiscal control have resulted in uh, the increase of the shadow economy and this does not seem to be bother to bother anyone the second is that there are some measures to attract investments such as uh, decreasing labor costs but the main obstacle remains the political risk economic instability and uh, taxation instability and why is nobody doing anything about this and there's a kind of more pe personal question for mr pisari this do you feel that you could personally help Greece or Cyprus in th who that are both uh, facing similar difficult junctures? Uh, okay, before I answer to these three questions, when we're talking about the private sector and you agreed that the private sector is against the changes, we kind of talk about uh, private the private sector as if it's a single unit. I've talked to, I've talked to quite a few entrepreneurs, perhaps not um, shall we say rep a representative sample, but um, it happens to be people that I meet when I come to Greece uh, or London because they are mainly employers and they definitely defend uh, these reforms in the economy. 
I don't know if by private sector you mean the labor unions, which uh, unf unfortunately I haven't had a chance to talk to any representatives of labor unions in Greece and Cyprus. I, I've managed to. So let's talk about the shadow economy. You're absolutely right. And I had used in a recent speech a comparison with a patient receiving a very potent drug and uh, they feel much more sick um, over the next few months until the disease is cured due to the drug. So, and we see now that with these reforms, we are trying to correct this problem of the shadow economy. and uh, um, But we are also <laughs> giving incentives for its spread. In the meantime, the only thing that I can say on this is that um, we need to have very rigid rules by the state, not with violence, of course, but uh, with... Um, uh, strict and severe fines for um, violators, uh, for for tax avoidance, for all these problems. This is a provisional solution. This is not what we want. What we want in the future is to provide incentives to entrepreneurs for being for being part of uh, uh, the official economy, but. If we leave everything free in uh, this uh, period where the votes have the, the the laws have been passed and but the results have not been yet achieved and we need four or five years until this, then things can get worse. This um, I've also heard from a few different politicians outside Greece. They see this problem. This they see that this is the only solution. Unfortunately. Now, regarding investments, we haven't seen any results yet because there is instability as uh, regards uh, investments. And I believe that the mistake, shall we may, or what's gone wrong with investments in Greece is that we didn't have in the beginning um, a political environment. We did not achieve an environment that would inspire stability before the implementation of investments. This had been achieved in Italy with the Monti government. They'd overcome this stability and when the reforms came, we had incentives for more investments and investments started bearing results. And this is why we haven't seen so much unemployment and instability in Italy compared to Greece, at least. This is more of a political problem and not an economic problem. It could be a problem of um, the political system in Greece, meaning that in Cyprus, for example, because the president holds um, all of the power and there's only a single president and you know, that's it. If he's elects it, that's, that's it. But um, we have um, elections here in two weeks. And despite the fact that I'm almost sure who's going to win the elections, it's uh, it's different to say that, you know, I expect uh, him to win and uh, a different thing to see him win, actually. Anyway, I think that um, we will overcome instabil this instability and we will see a return of investments. Unfortunately, in Greece, the system you have is different. It does have some advantages compared to ours because I believe that our political system gives too many powers to the president, which is not justified in a democracy, but it does have to do with the uh, Turkish community as well because the vice president is uh, a Turk and... Uh, you know there is there is there is no vice president now uh, which would act as a counterweight anyway the last thing uh, is um, if I could offer something I don't know I'd uh, I'd rather judge myself through the results and not my intentions but I, I do I do have the intention um, if an expert or a politician thinks that I can help 
if um, I would be more than willing, yes. And um, I've talked to, uh, with um, candidate uh, presidents here, especially one of the candidates, and um, yes, I can't exclude the possibility that I could uh, work with them at some point after the elections, but not, not with the current president, though. Okay, so that's a piece of news for us as well, Mr. Pisarides. This is Kateli Tatas for the floor, if we may have the microphone. I would like to greet Mr. Pisarides from Cyprus, says a speaker who's unfortunately off the microphone and we can barely hear. We shall try nevertheless. Let us greet Mr. Pisaridis, who is in Cyprus. I heard this discussion, and I fear that we have a rather simplistic notion and idea about how it is that the reform has been applied. I think that all of us agree with Mr. Pisaridis and Mrs. Richardson and what they said. Mr. Reid said the same, in fact, that everything boils down to the promotion of major change reform and what Schumpeter said, the destructive innovation on change. The question, however, is why is it that in some societies we can see reform facilitated and actually achieved and in some other societies we don't see such a thing? And why ever is it that in a country like Greece when efforts for reform have been made and in fact many significant efforts were made in the past, these efforts sooner or later stopped functioning and they were annulled, they were cancelled in due course. And I think that we need to uh, talk with political scientists and people from other fields of organization apart from economists that is. And I think that Mr. Kakatsoulis uh, thought about it in a fruitful way. We need to look into how it is that we can build alliances and organize as a society in order to be able to promote and bring about three, four, five reforms. I do not agree uh, on what Elena, uh, or with Elena, what she said that it's a, a matter of one leader. I don't agree with Timos uh, Pisarides, who said that it all boils down to political system and political leadership. I believe that it is something related to a leading group, and a leading group comprises people from the private sector, the public sector, the political system, the trade unions, and they need to reach a minimum consensus, political and social, and they need to try and bring about a results in three or four priority sectors. And Albert Hirschman, who's a very important theoretician and economist, said that growth alludes to the inability of society to organize for its own development and growth. In conclusion, to my mind, the three aspects that are important uh, in order to promote reform is to avoid certain things. What do we avoid first? What has been happening with the IMF, that is to dissolve a society, with, with to bring a society to dejection, to social weakness. When you have done that, you have truly undermined all those who seek reform, nor can you, under such circumstances of recession and unemployment, tell people that the problem is that we need to promote reform, because you do not have the minimum social consensus and tolerance vis-a-vis -vis a reform agenda. Thirdly, you have annulled and cancelled the entire political spectrum of people who would have wished to pursue reform. What is it that we need in a society like the Greek one, in my opinion, and this is what international experience shows. We need a decisive leading group, not one person alone, not a single person. We need people who are innovative and come from both the public sector and the private sector to jointly work, to collaborate, because in the private sector, my dear Phoebus, drawing in my experience, I've seen a great ambiguity, if you wish, and great reactions when we started talking about their own private interests. They had no problem whatsoever in telling you that they wanted reform, but provided the reform did not touch them. 
The same thing holds true about the public sector. Therefore, we need a group of leaders, a leading group, that will pave the way properly for a reform. This group needs to consist of people who are free of dependencies and people who can be independent enough and not caring about leaving power if need be. People willing to take risks. They need to be able to break some eggs to make an amulet. They need to have clear-cut priorities. What are the four, five basic changes that we need at this particular moment is a, a very important question. What are the alliances we need? What is the project management group that will follow up implementation, something that we do not do here in Greece, and what is the, the group that will follow up implementation, will evaluate, appraise, and make improvement, take improvement actions. If you think back to all the reforms that we have had, and we have had them galore, we had reforms regarding closed shop and everything, you name it, but there's nobody keeping track, there's nobody appraising. If you do not have a follow-up mechanism in order to appraise, evaluate, redesign, what you have done, then you enter a vicious circle, what has been happening throughout the past 15 to 20 years. That is, you see something start, stop in due course, you go back, you set back, you start anew. So what do we need to do? We need to properly organize in order to make progress in three, four different domains, be they related to tax evasion, reorganization of the public sector, improvement of entrepreneurship, promotion of innovation. We need to properly organize ourselves in order to do this. But how much room do we have to go back, Mrs. Catelis, is the question Mrs. Gavra is asking. I think that there is room. We need to decide on four domains, let's say, and have them in the nucleus of our own national plan for the restructure of our country. Mr. Georgiades would like to take the floor. I'll make a very short comment. A question, rather. I'd like to ask a question um, related to what Mrs. Catelli said about the re recession and reform in the environment of crisis. Let me tell you that our political system in the entirety of our society um, missed out on 10 years of cheap borrowing, cheap euro. They, they, they lost uh, this time. Mr. Pesaridis, let me ask you something. Can a country change production models? Can a country change the basic way in which its economic system works without going through an interim phase of recession? Can you at the same time change the entirety of your structures and have development simultaneously? This is my question. Thank you very much. Shall I answer? Please do. Are you waiting for me? Yes, Mr. Pesaridis, we can hear you. Regarding what uh, Mrs. Luca Cazzelli said, uh, I would like to say that I agree with her on what she said. What she said doesn't go against what I said before. When I said that we need a leader, I believe that in fact only a leading group can go about things successfully because the economy is so multifaceted today and it's so difficult for a person to be omniscient and know everything. However, this group, this leading group, needs a leader who will gather all these people and convince them. He'll be, if you wish, the person talking. Uh, that is a person uniting the, the group of leaders and the social agents and the general public. And in the democracies of our times, this person can be no other than a politician, somebody who was voted by the people. Again, I, I would like to use the example of Italy, the fact that Monti had not been elected and has stayed in power for so long was something of a particularity. And they reached the point when they said that, you know, if you wish to go on, you need to run for elections. This is the political system as it stands. And without one leader that is a single person that will bring all these people together, without one person who will be the one to convince the people that they do need these reforms, not much can be done. I agree, we need a leading group. You are right, and the country that has achieved this to the greatest possible extent is Holland. Holland hadn't 
pursued the great reforms in late 80s or 90s. They hadn't uh, experienced the problems that occurred in England or Germany because uh, different social actors had more communication, therefore problems were avoided to begin with. Now, regarding what Mr. Georgiadis said, unfortunately, the answer is no. No basic change in the system can be pursued with no recession. But the important aspect is how we cope with recession. And I would like to say that in the past, when the recession was not so heightened, both in Greece and abroad, I suppose one could talk about social provisions, temporary measures. I suppose that we would have been able to cope with the recession in such a manner so as to make sure that the person facilitating reform does not lose their popularity. But now this turning point is much more difficult and that is why I placed emphasis on special developmental projects. If the Troika has dealt with things in a very mistaken way and you're, you're right, I agree with you on that. I suppose that the IMF have learned from their mistakes because they've uh, faced the same uh, problems in uh, Spain and Cyprus. Now they are far better in dealing with uh, Spaniards and Cypriots because they have learned from their Greek experience. If the IMF said, OK, uh, you do what you do, and now I'll start a great developmental project, let's say the, um, the development of the old airport facilities, or perhaps I'll build uh, a new port for you because um, you lost your previous port uh, to the Turks, talking about Cyprus, for instance, because of the occupation, and they actually activate and engage some thousands of people, then things are far, far better, and the recession would not be heightened. But here in Greece, uh, the IMF had not talked about development projects, but now they come, OK, don't stop them, cut down on other expenses. And the government considers it more easily done to do away with uh, development and growth uh, projects. So the answer is no. Unfortunately, patient treatment will bring about initial exacerbation before cure is reached. Mr. Papayanidis has the floor. I'd like to say something uh, which is different from what Mr. Pesaridis and Mr. Yorgiadis said. There's one thing to have more depression, and another thing is to have a dead economy. If the economy has minus 35 in a year and a half from now, for instance, then we're not talking about an economy. and. Hearing uh, about IMF learning, it's very pleasant to, to actually realize that there are some people who do have a learning curve, but I think they've been quite slow in learning because some people will die in the process. And this is a little bit of a problem. One needs to be alive in order to change. Uh, now, regarding conjecture and timing, if, I, if the IMF played with uh, the denominator, and if we have, for example, uh, the fortune to have uh, one coming from IMF, a uh, person who knew that the multiplier did not do very well, for instance, then it's one thing. But the times of adaptation, we started with uh, three years. We pleaded for two, if you don't remember. The first government wanted to adopt and adjust in two years, and the IMF said, OK, in three. Three, time, uh, three years, if such things happen without a horizon of 10 years, and if the IMF and the EU that also has room for improvement in their learning curve should understand that without ample time, um, ample to accommodate one or two election periods and uh, NSRFs, uh, things cannot be easily done. Timing, Mr. Pesaridis, what would you like to say on that? In Greece, we had most of the mistakes made by the IMF at the beginning, and we had great political uncertainty. Not so much now as uh, it happened before. Uh, last May, they 
if, if you think about it, both in Europe and all over the world, they had uh, thought that Greece is over, they'll go bankrupt, they'll default, they said they'll get out of the European Union, etc. Now things have started stabilizing. In terms of time and timing, I would say that what will determine time, in effect, is political stability, because political stability will bring about investments, and what Mrs. Katzeli said before, that is, that no matter what change happens, if there is not a leading group comprising uh, employees' organizations, trade union members, etc., uh, people who will say that this will be very good for our society and please do it, then we'll have a delay, an avoidable delay. I had said something in uh, Republic a few months ago, and I think that it was published in Greece too. If all these prerequisites uh, are met, then in two years, the economy should start exhibiting a positive rate of development and growth. But we, all, we, we have these prerequisites and these conditions. Political stability, first and foremost, is of paramount importance because it is uh, directly connected to investments that will facilitate things. Mr. Pesarius, do we have questions? Or do we have time for yet another question? Yes, of course, answers Mr. Pesarius. Mr. Pesarides, uh, good afternoon. Haris Economopoulos from the Eleftherotypia newspaper. Uh, please allow me to, to be a little bit provocative. First comment, I have uh, the, I'm under the impression that you approach things theoretically, but things are practical, they need practical solutions. You're talking about leaders. Yesterday I left uh, the football field, I had bought a, a a lottery, for example, uh, uh, I had bought a lottery ticket and I couldn't help thinking that it would be very, very nice for me to have the money to regenerate the newspaper I work for and bring back some people in order to put it to practical use. We have a system that not, does not facilitate things. My question is concrete. Mr. Pissari, this from the study that you carried out regarding Greek reality, what, in your opinion, is the first priority, the uppermost priority, the first thing we need to, to deal with. And second, do you think that Greece is practically governable with this political system? Well, difficult questions you have broached. Now, regarding the theoretical approach, yes, of course, I admit this. We talk about systems, as I had said before. I said this is the ideal thing. If you think about it, ideal more or less alludes to, to theoretical. What would be the best way to bring about reforms in a country? And we talked about it before. Now, when it comes to practice, things change. I have uh, spoken to people who are much more familiar with Greek reality than I am, and they too told me that it is uh, impossible with the present political system to achieve something like this. And this is uh, question, question number three, whether or not Greece is governable with the present political system. Last May, uh, I would say yes. So it seems to be. And in fact, back then, we had talked about it. I was here because we had the Cyprus presidency, and I was here for a European meeting, and we had talked about this issue uh, last May. And during the breaks, people said this. This is a non-governable country, people said. What shall we do about it? Uh, this is an ungoverned, rather. Now, I don't uh, want to take parts. I am non-partisan. I don't support a political party here in Greece. But I would like to say that the country has stabilized. It seems much more manageable and uh, governable now. At least this is the European impression. When Greek politicians go to Europe, they um, speak in a far more uh, dignified way, and they convince people more easily. And now people do not talk about Greece having to be ousted from uh, the Eurozone and Greece having to, to quit the Euro. Uh, and this is something that gives me hope and courage. You know, when things 
go to extreme edges when the going gets tough. Um, we just take a leap back and we don't jump from the cliff. We don't jump over the cliff. We, we tend to do this in Greece. Now, what is priority number one in uh, Greece? I think that corruption, combat, corruption, eradication is very important. Something convincing people and people in the private sector first and foremost that steps are taken and uh, action is achieved. When I was in Greece a few months ago, to give you an example, I went to a, to a tourist shop in order to buy something. A small thing, a small item. and. The owner there started talking to me about the reforms necessary and the fact that all of us need to be abide by the law, pay taxes, be law abiding, etc. He talked at me, in fact, and I said, okay, you're right, you're very right. And he, he made sense. And when uh, the time came for me to, to pay for the small light, and he said, would you mind my not giving you a receipt? Because when these people in the parliament start doing as they should, then I'll start giving people receipts. 